Acts chapter 22. If you guys are taking notes this morning, you guys can tell this morning's message, I have lived in all good conscience. I have lived in all good conscience. Let's read together simply one verse this morning, and then we'll pray. And that verse is out of chapter 23, verse 1. It says, Then Paul, looking earnestly at the council, said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Let's pray. Father, we come before you, Lord, this morning. And God, even as we focus on the conscience, Father, that that, that inner built-in thing, Lord, that some of us might not even be able to articulate what it is. We can't necessarily even put into words how to describe it. But Lord, we know it exists. And God, we know that your word talks about this thing called our conscience. And so God, we pray as we study your word together this morning that you would minister and speak to our heart. Lord, you have our attention. And we want to hear from you. So Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Paul said, I have lived in all good, or I have lived in all good conscience. But before we get to verse 1 of chapter 23, I want to just kind of review for you guys, give you guys a little bit of background to keep this um, chapter 23, verse 1 in context. So would you guys begin with me in chapter 22? beginning in verse 21. This is where we left off last Sunday. You guys might remember Paul was addressing this mob, this crowd that wanted to kill him. And what he was doing was he was standing before them, he's arrested, and he asked for permission to speak to them. And you guys remember he stands before this crowd that wants to kill him. He raises his hand, sort of like, can I have a moment to speak to you? He goes on and he begins to give them his testimony. If you were with us last Sunday morning, we talked about how it says that Paul began to give his defense. And that word defense is where we get our English word for apologetics or apologia, which is where we are able to stand before people and defend our faith. It's what Peter said when he said, You know, be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you for the hope that lies within you, your defense. But what was interesting about last week was Paul's defense was his story, his testimony. You see, all of us at some point in our Christian walk, we might take a class, we might study, we might read a book on apologetics or giving a defense. And there's all sorts of techniques, there's all sorts of strategies, there's all sorts of ways and directions in which people will teach you to share your defense or to give a defense for the hope that lies within you. But what's fascinating about last Sunday was Paul used his testimony to give a defense. He used his story, what Jesus had done in his life. He recounted for this crowd the Acts chapter 9 experience that took place in his life. He said, there was one day I was anti-God. I hated Jesus. I wanted to destroy Christianity. And then all of a sudden, as I was in that moment, in that place, in that season of life, Jesus sent this light. He used something, you guys remember the word, suddenly to get my attention. And he goes and he's simply sharing his story. He talks about how he began to call upon the Lord. He talks about how God was speaking to a man by the name of Ananias and how God used Ananias in his life. And everything was going well until verse 21. Would you guys read it with me? It says, Then he said to me, Depart, for I will send you far from here to the Gentiles. Verse 22, And they listened to him until this word. And so as Paul was giving his defense, everything was going smooth until that one word. The word was Paul said to this crowd, and God began to use me. And I began to speak his word. And then all of a sudden, God sent me to the Gentiles. 
And when you're speaking to a predominantly Jewish crowd that didn't believe that God loved the Gentiles or the, those that were outside of the Jewish race, this now became sort of an offensive thing to them. A wall now became the, um, was put up, and it says that they listened to him until he said the word Gentiles. In verse 22, it says, Then they raised their voices and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for he is not fit to live. Verse 23, Then as they cried out and tore off their clothes and threw dust into the air, the commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks and said that he should be examined under scourging so that he might know why they shouted so against him. He said the word Gentile, and then everything changed. The silence turned back to screaming. The curious faces be turned to hatred. He said Gentiles. God would send a man to share salvation with the Gentiles. God would send a man to this despised group of people and share with them that God loved them. They couldn't handle it. And so they begin to scream. We want this man to die. He's not fit to live. It says in verse 23 that they tore off their clothes. And notice in verse 23, it says they threw dust into the air. Typically in this sort of moment or setting, someone would be getting stoned. It reminds you of what happened with Stephen back in Acts chapter 7. He got stoned for speaking words similar to these. And so it was at that moment that as Paul opened up his mouth, they want to go to stone him, but the place where they were, there were no stones, and so as literally get the picture with me, they're picking up, they're, they're reaching down to pick up stones, and yet all there was was dust. And so they take the dust and they begin to toss it, and yet obviously it doesn't have the same effect as stoning. And so in verse 24, it says that he's now ordered to be examined under scourging. You guys remember the word scourging? It's what took place prior to Jesus on the cross. You guys remember scourging was where they would take a person's body and his back would be fully exposed and they would tie his arms to a post where his back is, is completely exposed and there would be two people, one on each side, with whips. And this whip would have bones and metal and glass attached to it. And they would take the person, and notice the word there, they were examining them. But really the picture is they were interrogating them. And they would use scourging to get information out of people. Okay, I'm going to count to three, and if you don't snitch on someone, if you don't tell me the truth... If you don't open your mouth, you're going to get a whipping. And so there they are, and they're using this tactic on Paul. What do you mean God loves the Gentiles? What do you mean this whole thing about Jesus is the Messiah? What they're trying to do is they're trying to get information out of Paul. They're trying to get him most likely to even denounce his faith in Jesus. But what's fascinating about this particular picture here is this wasn't the first time we've seen scourging. The first time we're introduced to scourging was Jesus. But you guys remember in Isaiah 53 where we get that prophetic word about the Messiah and Jesus and everything else. And, and one of the things that it said about Jesus was that he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. You guys remember that? But there was this fascinating thing that Isaiah 53 says where Jesus did not open his mouth. You guys remember the verse? Even in the midst of about to get flogged, in the midst of even being threatened to be whipped or bruised, it says that he did not open his mouth. So if you could go back with me for a moment to that Good Friday, to that Passion movie if you've ever seen it, where Jesus was being whipped, where his flesh was literally being torn off of bone, where as he was being whipped, 
some people describe the whole scene there as his back turned into what looked like hamburger meat. I mean, you guys have seen that visual. It says in the midst of even that, he did not open his mouth. But the reason why that was so important was because they whipped criminals trying to get them to snitch or confess. But the interesting thing is, what if Jesus would have opened his mouth at that moment? What would there have been for him to confess? It would have been yours and my sin, wouldn't it? And so that's why he kept silent, even in the midst of a beating. Because he didn't con- to condemn the world, but to save the world. That through, the, that through him, the world might be what? Saved. And so he kept silent in his moment of scourging. But yet in Paul's moment, would you guys keep reading with me in verse 25? It says, as they bound him with thongs, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it, is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is a Roman and uncondemned? Then the centurion heard that. He went and told the commander, saying, Take care what you do, for this man is a Roman. Then the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman? He said, Yes. And the commander answered, said, With, with a large sum, I obtained my citizenship. Or it, it, took me a, it cost me a lot to become a citizen of Rome. And Paul said, But I was born a citizen. Then immediately those who were about to examine him or scourge him, or interrogate him, withdrew from him. And the commander was also afraid, for he found out that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. So here in this text, right as he's about to be whipped, as he's about to be examined or interrogated, someone mentions to the commander, this man's a Roman. Under Roman law, a Roman couldn't be um, interrogated in this manner. And so for them to do this, if they had put one whip on Paul, they themselves, the one who executed or even gave the command for Paul to be whipped, would have had to die himself. And so they stop and they question Paul, are you Roman? Yeah. Well, how are you a Roman? You see, me, I'm not a Roman, but I paid and I was able to be bought into being a Roman. And Paul says, well, I'm a citizen. And then all of a sudden, the entire scene changes here. They're like, we're not going to touch him. Because if we touch him and and it comes out that this man really is a Roman, our lives, our heads are at stake. And so it says in verse 30 that the next day, because he wanted to know for certain why he was accused by the Jews... He released them from his bonds and commanded the chief priest and all their council to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. So at the end of verse 22 here, we see that what the commander does is he says, okay, we're not going to do anything to this man, but there is a group that can touch him. You see, he's Roman, so we can't put our hands on him. But there is a group that could decide his fate. So what they do is they call upon the high priest and the Sanhedrin. Some of you guys might remember the Sanhedrin was that 70 member, I guess the equivalent of today would be sort of the um, supreme council or, 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 or the, the, what, what's the highest um, courtroom that you could take it to? Supreme court. supreme court. And so this would be sort of the supreme court. Where, I mean, these guys could touch anyone. They could do as they please. And so we're going to take them to the Supreme Court. We're going to take them to this council, to the Sanhedrin. And they have the power to do whatever it is that they want to Paul. In fact, one of the things that we'll notice is that Paul used to be himself a member of the Sanhedrin. So store that in the back of your mind as we head into chapter 23, verse 1. It says in verse 1, then Paul, looking earnestly at the council. And we're going to stop there for a second. So now he's brought before a different group of men. And we're told that he looks, he's staring. 
almost sort of like a, 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 he's making eye contact with these guys. One of the things that was in the news this week that was pretty big was the Aaron Hernandez trial. You guys know the ex-football player that was convicted of murder this week. And you guys know me, I, I love football, I love sports, period, and so this whole story's kind of caught my attention. It's something that I've been following for the last couple of years. And, and so this week, as the murder conviction and he's sentenced, one of the things they did the very following day was the jurors had their time in the spotlight. And so the jurors are doing all sorts of news broadcasts. They, and one of the news broadcasts that they, um, that they did this week was Anderson Cooper on CNN. And so Anderson Cooper's sitting there, and he has the 12 jurors in front of him, and, and he's asking them questions. And one of the questions that he asked them was, did you ever make eye contact with Aaron Hernandez? As the verdict was being read, did any of you swap a gaze with the man that you guys were sending to prison for the rest of his life? And there were a couple of them that said, no, I just looked straight ahead. I didn't even want to look at him. There were a couple that said, in that moment, we made eye contact. Literally, as a man's life was being decided. And I had one of the deciding votes on the rest of this man's life. They said we made eye contact. And that's the closest that I could picture to what's taking place here. Paul is brought before these men, 70 of them, 71 if you count the high priest, and it says he's staring at them. He's gazing earnestly at the council. I mentioned Paul was once on that council. And so Paul knows how the council works. He knows the corruption that's within the council. He knows the way they think. He once sat in that seat, so he even knows the way that they interrogate, the way that they examine someone, the methods that they use to try to draw out the information that they're seeking. And so he gazes at the council, and these were his words, verse 1. He says, men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. He says, one of the things that I can tell you guys, you leaders, you, give me your eyes for a minute, church, you powerful men, Paul would say, he says that I have lived with a good conscience before God until this day. Literally what he's saying is he's looking these men in the eye and in some ways what he's accusing them of is he says you guys can't sleep at night. You guys know the power that you have and you know the corruption within your ranks and you know that you have the authority and people's lives are literally in your hands. You know. He says, since the day I gave my life to the Lord, I've been able to live with a good conscience. And literally what he's looking at these men and saying, is he's saying, I know you don't. There's a chance you don't sleep good at night. There's a chance that some of the things that you do, they bother you throughout the day. You dwell on them. You think about them. You know a good way to tell if your conscience is clear is when you're driving down the street, how do you react when a police is behind you? I mean, think about that for a minute. When the cops are behind you, how do you drive? You know, those of you with no warrants, no secret stashes under the car mats, nothing hidden in your pocket, no warrant for your arrest. I mean, you could literally sit there and drive. You could lean back like a, like a cholo or like an essay. And, you know I mean, you could just roll with the cost behind you because you're like, man, if they pull me over, they ain't going to find anything. I mean, it's just like my conscience is clear. And yet some of us, when we're driving, we're paranoid because we know we didn't fix that tail light. You know, I mean, we, we feel, oh, man, he's going to find out. Or we know... That we got something under the, I hope you guys ain't got nothing under your seats, but I mean, maybe, you never know. 
you know. I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, man, your heart starts being fast. And, and for me, I, I, when, when I have Christina and the kids in the car, I drive good. I mean, I, I have peace when I drive. I mean, I just, I drive and, and it's just, it feels good. Because I'm like, you could pull me over, man. You can have my license, my DNV, you know what I mean? I got insurance. I, I, I got full coverage, you know what I mean? I, I'm good. But it was funny because about a month ago, I took my brothers out for lunch. And oh my goodness, I mean, I was paranoid the whole time. You guys, if you guys don't know, my brothers are like genuine gangsters, you know? They got stuff across their chest, you know, and tatted. And, and, and so I'm, I'm driving with these guys and my brother works for UPS. I'm like, wear your UPS outfit. You know, the cops won't pull us over. Like, put your hat on. Before they got in my car, I'm like, you know, empty out your pockets. I mean, I, I don't want no baggies in my car. I mean, I, I don't know what you got. Lift up your shirt. I'm, I'm checking for guns. You know, I mean, th th this is how I drive when I'm with these guys. And it was funny because as I was picking them up, we went to eat. And we're driving back to drop them off. And a cop right there on Van Ness and Gardena just came right behind me. And, I'm, and I mean, I just tensed up. And I started shaking. And my brother's like, yo, man, why are you shaking? I'm like, because you're in my car. You know, it's just like, <laughs> he's all, well, well, anything wrong with you? I go, nothing's wrong with me, but everything's wrong with you. And if this guy pulls me over, you have to have something. I, I know. You got a warren. You know, you probably beat someone last night and you were on the news and they're looking for you. I mean, something's going on with you guys. And, 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 and I'll tell you, you could tell the difference when there's a cop behind you. That clear conscience. And so we all know what it's like to be able to sleep at night. It was funny when we were starting service. Worship just started and a cop walked in. And all of a sudden, my heart was like, what do we do? It was funny, Arlen's wife, Jessica, she started running. I, I don't know why. I, I, she either had to go to the restroom really quick or, or she, she was scared because the cops came. I don't know what it was, but I mean, Jessica just started. I mean, she was, uh, she was a sprinter at that moment. But I was like, what's going on with Arlen and Jessica? But I mean, it, it was kind of weird. <laughs> oh, they took her. <laughs> I, I don't know where she is, but it was, it was just crazy. Because it does something to you when your conscience is dirty, when your conscience isn't good. And Paul was able to look at these guys and he was able to say, I've lived with a good conscience before God until this day. There's a couple of things that I want to do for the remainder of our time. We're going to stay here. Arlen went to check on her now. In verse 1, there's a couple of things. First thing that I want to just kind of throw out there to you guys. First thing is Paul is about to deliver a, main, a message to the Sanhedrin. But what's interesting about this particular uh, this message is this is the fifth time recorded in the Bible where someone is about to share the gospel with this group of men. I'm sure there were other occasions and I'm sure there were more times but this is the fifth time that the Holy Spirit allows a man to put pen to paper and record that the Sanhedrin was having the gospel shared with them. The first time that the Sanhedrin, we have recorded for us, had the gospel shared with them was when Jesus shared the gospel with them. And then the second time that they had the gospel shared with them was when Peter and John were confronted or placed before the Sanhedrin and they shared the gospel with them. The third time that they had the gospel shared with them, they had the entire 12 disciples brought before them and they shared the gospel with them. The most recent time that it's recorded in Scripture that they had the gospel shared with them for the fourth time was when Stephen in Acts chapter 7 shared the gospel before the Sanhedrin. And you guys remember the Bible says that his face glowed as he was sharing this message. And now here in Acts chapter 23, Paul is going to share the gospel with them for the fifth time. The fifth time. For the fifth time, these guys are about to receive an anointed testimony. For the fifth time, these men are about to receive an anointed gospel presentation. Why do I keep mentioning the fifth time? But Because 
the number five is significant in the Bible. And if you guys don't know, there are certain numeric numbers or certain numeric relationships in the Bible that are interesting. Whether or not the numbers really have a significance is still debated, but it's still interesting to take a look at some of these things. Let me give you guys a couple examples. Did you guys know the number one in the Bible is the number of, anybody know? Unity. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, we were told that the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Ephesians 4, 5, we're told that there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And so the number one in the Bible, if you begin to put it together, it, it signifies, it gives a picture of unity. The number two in the Bible is a picture of division. You guys remember Jesus, the Son, has two natures, human and divine. He put on skin, and yet he was still God. The Bible has two testaments, the Old Testament, the New Testament. God created man, both male and what? If you don't get this one right, you get a big old F, male and what? Female. And so there's a division with the number two in the Bible. The number three in the Bible gives or speaks of the divine perfection of God. You guys remember, this one's obvious, the Trinity consists of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This one's kind of interesting. The word, the number four, is the number of creation. What do I mean? You got north, south, east, west. There are four seasons. Number four is the number of creation. And then the number five, and this is what we're going to focus on for a moment, is the number of grace. You guys remember in 1 Samuel chapter 17 in the story where David is about to go head to head with Goliath. We're told that David picked up five smooth stones to fight Goliath with. And it was interesting because on that particular day, God was very gracious with Israel and with David and allowing them to have victory over their enemy. And so the number five, it is the number of grace. Now I want you guys to connect the dots with me for a minute. Give me your eyes, church. The number five is the number of grace. This is the fifth time that this particular group has had the gospel shared with them. Make the connection with me for a moment. You see, God is very gracious in continually putting the gospel before people, isn't he? And I think about all of us, most of us in here, we probably did not accept Jesus into our heart the first time it was shared. Some of you maybe, but for others it took time. And the Lord was very gracious in continually putting people in your path who would share the gospel with you. You know, maybe your parents shared the gospel with you and it didn't do anything. And then God brought a friend. God brought someone in college. God brought a teacher. God brought someone into your life and they share the gospel with you. Maybe it clicked, maybe it didn't, and yet God was still very gracious. And God has shared, and he's used instruments to share the gospel with you. And so I'm looking at this group of men, this group that you and I, when we think of the Sanhedrin, when we think of the scribes, there are certain people in the Bible that we look, and we automatically want to wipe them out, destroy them. We want nothing to do with them. We're like bad people. And yet God looks and God says, I'm actually very gracious to them. Just like I was very gracious to you. in continually sharing the gospel with you. In Isaiah 55, verse 11, the Lord says, He, I send my word forth from my mouth, and I shall not return to me void, but I shall accomplish what I please, and I shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. He says, every time I send my, my word forth, every time the gospel is presented to someone, it's because of grace. Even if it's the fifth time, he says, it's grace. He says, I love you. I send my word forth. And I know that it's planting a seed. I know that it's doing something in someone's heart. And it's not returning void. And so, first thing we see in verse 1 is Paul, for the fifth time now, is sharing the gospel with this group. But second thing, and this is what I want to spend the rest of our time on this morning. Number two, Paul mentions 
that he lived in all good conscience. And what I want to do in the remainder of our time is I want to focus on, dig in a little with this word conscience in the Scriptures. It says that he stood before them and he mentions that he had a conscience. And it was a good conscience. But what's kind of interesting is the wording here. Because there's two interpretations for what Paul is saying here. He says, I've lived in all good conscience till this day. So there's two ways of believing. First one is Paul was literally saying, I've had a good conscience since the day I was born. Or Paul is saying, I've had a good conscience since the day I was born again. Well, both are right. What do I mean? Well, before Paul came to know Jesus and his testimony, his Damascus Road experience, in his conscience, he really believed that destroying Christianity was the right thing. Think about that for a minute. He wasn't going around just cruel. He was going around with a zeal. And in his mind, it was a good hatred. It was a godly hatred. Obviously, it was misdirected. It was false. But in his conscience, he literally thought he was doing a good thing by trying to destroy Christianity. And yet, obviously, since the day he gave his life to the Lord, he, cannot, he can honestly say, I have a good conscience and a right conscience. And I think it's important that we distinguish between the two. It's possible to have a good conscience, yet not have a right conscience. There are things that we can sit there and, and literally fill in our heart, and especially if we don't know the Lord. There's a lot of good people out there. There's a lot of good people out there who don't know the Lord who do good things. They do good humanitarian things. They do good things and, and care for people. They do good things with the homeless. They do good things for their children. And they go to bed at night, and they're able to rest peacefully because in their conscience, they have a good conscience. Yet, there comes a moment where someone shares the Lord with them or the gospel with them. And then all of a sudden, their conscience, just like ours went into, it goes into an uproar, doesn't it? Now you're not so peaceful. The moment that the Holy Spirit truly convicts you of your sin, you're like, wait, but I'm a good person. But yet the Bible teaches this, that I need Jesus. No, 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 I do good things. And yet Romans 6 says that we're, none of us are good. It says, hey, the wages of sin is death, and we've all sinned. And, and then all of a sudden, what does your conscience do? It begins to wrestle, doesn't it? Until you give your life to the Lord. And so both ways of looking at conscience, I guess, could be accurate. He had a good conscience before the Lord, but he had a right conscience when he came to know the Lord. And so what Paul is saying, he's saying, from the day of my salvation, my conscience has not bothered me. And I think it's important that we recognize that Paul is not claiming to be perfect or without sin, but what he is saying is that he can stand before God knowing a few things. There's quite a few things, but let me give you a few if you're taking notes. One of the things that Paul could say before God with a good conscience was that he was in God's perfect will. So he could literally look to God and say, God, my conscience is clear because I know that I'm in your perfect will. Paul could look to the Lord and say, hey, I have a good conscience because I have repented of any sin in my life. And so he would be able to put his head to pillow at evening and say, there isn't anything habitual, there isn't anything hidden in my life that I'm harboring. There's nothing that my wife doesn't know about, and more importantly, God, there's nothing that you don't know about. There's nothing that people around me don't know about because I've confessed those things. I'm not hiding anything. God or Paul had a good conscience. One of the things, and I think this one's important for all of us here this morning, is Paul was able to say, you know what, I have a good conscience because I've been unashamed of the gospel. And I've proclaimed it at every opportunity. 
he was able to say that he had a good conscience because he shared his faith with the lost. I want to stop there for a minute. Can we make that same declaration? You know, I, mean, I think about it. There are people in our life that we see on a daily basis. There are people who are blood to us who don't know the Lord. Where we've sat there, and like I was talking about with my brothers earlier, we've gone, we go out to eat with them, we watch shows with them, we play sports with them, we go to the gym with them, we do all these things with them, and yet we don't share the gospel with them. And let's be honest, if something were to happen to them and they were to breathe their last, not knowing the Lord, your conscience would kill you. There would be a heavy guilt that you would go to or go through till the day you went to be with the Lord because you would kick yourself and say, I should have shared with them. I should have told them. We should have spent less time eating and more time sharing. Less time watching TV and more time going to church. Well, I'm just not that kind of person. Then bring him to church with you. You don't have to do anything other than say, do you want to go to church? I'll pick you up. I'll take you to brunch after. It worked for me, right? You know, so it's like one of those things where it's just like, but imagine. Can I, can I share your story that you shared with us last week? About your friend in the car and, uh, Matthew, last week, he was, he was like, what am I going to tell you no in front of everyone? But anyways, <laughs> last week, Matthew was sharing with us that when it was in high school, he had a friend, and his dad bought him like this sports car, Ferrari, one of those kind of cars. Uh, no, it was a Corvette. And one day, this friend decided, you know, he was going to take Matthew home and drop him off, and this guy was driving crazy. If Matthew... When he got home, there was like this conviction in his heart, like, man, I need to say something. This guy's going to kill himself. He's going to kill somebody. This guy, the way he drives. And, and there was a group of them. There was a bunch of friends that all thought the same way, and yet no one said anything. Well, one day, that friend in his Corvette crashed. And in high school, that friend died. And he was sharing with us last week that there, there's this conviction. There's this, I should have said something. You know, there's this regret that he, that, that he had there. And I just think for all of us, what if someone near you were to die tomorrow? Could you be able to say like Paul, I have not shunned to declare to everyone the gospel of God. You know, I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I've shared it with everyone in my life. I'm unashamed of it. And I proclaimed it every opportunity I got. So why is Paul able to say I have a good conscience? Well, there's a few things. But I think the more important thing for us here this morning is for us to be able to handle business. Give me a for in the church. For us to be able to handle business with God when it comes to our conscience. You see, if you're here this morning, you're not within God's perfect will, you won't be able to rest completely because your conscience is going to bother you. If you haven't repented of any sin or if there's any hidden sin or if you've been harboring any habitual sin, you're not going to be able to rest because your conscience is going to continually bother you. If you haven't been sharing the gospel, if you haven't been telling others about Jesus, that Jesus loves them and you love them, it's going to bother you. And so Paul was able to say, you know what, I've lived with a good conscience to this point in my life. Martin Luther once said, it is neither right nor safe to go against my conscience. And yet, for some of us, we go against our conscience every day. And the Spirit of God is in us and He's telling us to do certain things and to open our mouths in certain situations. And yet we go against our conscience. Let me give you guys three things in closing that the Bible says about our conscience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it to you from the perspective of danger, 
there are three dangers that could happen to our conscience. And what I want you guys to notice is how gradual the danger is to our conscience. Number one, in closing this morning, our conscience can be defiled. Would you write this verse down? Titus chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Unto the pure all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. So this is what happens. You give your life to the Lord, the Holy Spirit's dwelling in you, and yet you begin to compromise just a little bit. Well, the word defiled, it literally means to become impure or tainted. It's literally talking about you give your life to the Lord and and your life is in a sense like a cup of clear water. And yet you just go and you just put one little drop in that water and all of a sudden it just, it taints it just a bit. And yet if someone were to drink it, you could taste that it's been defiled, that it's been altered, that it's not pure anymore. And yet every time you compromise, what do you do? You're just dropping another little drop into the pure cup of water. And the more you compromise, the more drops go into the water, guess what happens? It becomes defiled. It becomes something undrinkable. And that's what happens with our conscience. It's just one song. It's just a couple GDs in the movie. I mean, it, but it's a good movie. Did you see how many awards it got? Did you see whose a name is attached? But, it, but I know what God's words. It's just, and it's just these little compromises. It's just one show. They only had like eight swear words in the thing, and you know, and my kids only caught like two of them. So I mean, it, it's okay. It's just those little tiny compromises. And what happens? It begins to defile. And he says, when it comes to our conscience, the more you compromise, the more it becomes defiled. It's like being in a dating relationship and someone says, how far can we go and yet it not be too far? I would say, how far away can you get from the line and just please the Lord in your relationship till you get married? No, but I want to know how far I can get. Can we touch? Can we hold hands? Can we make out? Well, if you're making out, I mean, I, I, I taught high school, so obviously the things I share sometimes are you know, but, but I, I look at it, when you're making out with someone, and hey, I mean, it's getting steamy. What are you thinking about? You're not thinking about your grandma's fried chicken, you know, it's like, you're all in there, and, 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 oh, grandma's fried chicken. No, you're thinking about things that have to do with passion and lust. And you're literally putting yourself in a position where this thing could go even further. You get what I'm saying? So can we do that? You could do that. Is it sexual morality? No, it's not technically sexual morality. But what I am telling is opening a door. It's just one little drop. And I think it it could progress into other things. And I think that's the, you know, things that we need to consider. It's like the whole cigarette thing. You know, you guys have heard me talk about cigarettes. Can, Can a Christian smoke and still go to heaven? Yes. You're probably going to get there 20 years earlier too. But so you might, you're going to see Jesus faster. But could it open up the door? Could it be a gateway to bigger? Yes, it could be, or maybe it couldn't be. But why would you even want to fool around with those things? And so that's the picture here of our conscience being defiled. Just one little drop. Number two, the Bible says that the progression leads to our conscience. Number two, being seared, our conscience being seared, S-E-A-R-E-D, seared. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. So the idea here is branding. You guys ever seen where they take the animals and they brand them? They heat it up and, they, and there's like smoke coming out, ah, you know, and the animals are screaming. But I'll tell you guys, once once they got branded, those nerves within that part, 
you could go back and, t- and, and they don't feel it anymore. And some of us have had that happen even to parts of our body, parts of our skin, where they become so infected that you could do things to them. You're like, I don't even feel it. I don't even feel it. And it's the same way with our conscience. If we keep on going, we keep on compromising, eventually it could become seared to where it literally burns any effect, any nerve, any feeling, any emotion, it becomes seared. And I think it's important that we realize, let me say this, that our conscience, we could look at it as a big alarm system for our body. Think about it like this. There was a guy, a story's told, where he was sleeping in a tent. And he had a dog outside his tent. And the dog was supposed to warn him if anyone was trying to come. So one night, this guy was so tired that he goes, puts the dog outside, goes to sleep in his tent. The dog starts barking. And so the guy's like, shut up out there. You know, be quiet and, you know, go back to sleep. Stop barking. The guy puts his head back on the pillow, goes back to sleep. The dog starts barking again, and, and the guy's like, I, this dumb dog. And so he goes out and he cusses out the dog, you know, yeah, and just lets him have it. And, and you just need to be quiet and everything else. And dog shuts up for a moment and go, he goes back, puts his head on the pillow, falls back asleep. He's resting. Well, a couple of minutes pass, and all of a sudden the dog starts barking again. And so guy gets this dumb dog. So he goes out, he starts kicking the dog. I told you to be quiet. And he's kicking the dog, and the dog shuts up and the dog's quiet and guy goes back in puts us on the pillow goes back to sleep well not even a minute passes the dog starts barking again guy goes out kills the dog the animal lovers close your ears but he goes out and he kills the dog ah this to get the dog to shut up now and so he goes dog's dead goes back to sleep well the next moment the guy some intruders come into his tent kill him guy's done What's the point of the story? The dog was the what? Alarm. It was the warning. What was the dog trying to get across? There's someone here. Danger's coming. And yet what did the guy do? He wiped out his alarm. And in the same way, the more we compromise, the more we wipe out our alarm, our conscience, to where we don't feel it anymore. And number three, and then we'll pray, the Bible says that our conscience can become evil our conscience can become evil hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 it says let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water so the bible says it starts with compromise just a drop just a drop he says that drop turns into you not feeling anything nothing moves you anymore He says, and eventually it just turns into a full-on, full-blown evil conscience. You guys can close your Bibles. We're done today. But have you ever run, ran into someone who used to go to church or someone who used to have a walk with God and they have no care for anything that has to do with God anymore? We've all ran into people like that. We've all maybe even have some of those people in our families. Well, how'd they get there? It wasn't just one day. It wasn't just I woke up this morning and I hate God. I want nothing to do with him, nothing to do with his word, nothing to do with his people, I want nothing to do with anything that connected. No, no, no. It was slow. If you were to really sit down with them and they were to be honest with you, it was a slow drip. It was just something in the heart. They let that thing birth. After it birthed, it, it started to grow. Compromise started to happen. And little by little, they stopped feeling it. And eventually, they stopped caring. And so I think this morning, some of us need to take our soul, take our spirit, take our conscience this morning and offer them to the Lord. Because there's only three places it could be. It could be good, where Paul is, where I know I'm right smack in the will of God and I could sleep at night. Or there might be some of us, it's just starting. It's just tainted, defiled. For some of us, it's seared. You're you're starting to stop feeling it. 
or it could be full-blown, it's just evil now, and I don't care. So we need to offer our conscience to, to the Lord. Father.